One of the most powerful religious experiences of my growing up was attending Novena. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's nine days of prayer, which may be nine consecutive days or nine days spread over weeks. My mother would uh, invite me to go, and when you're one of six children, you grab any opportunity you can to be alone with your mother. Um, It only occurred to me yesterday that perhaps the reason why she was going to Novena was me, uh, because usually you took your problems or concerns or whatever. So Wednesday night in my parish was Novena night, and you could pick up and finish whenever you liked. And it was so different to Sunday church. It was nighttime, of course. Uh, there were candles, and um, it was the same building, but the hymns were different, the prayers were different, the liturgy was different, and everyone knew everything by heart. It was this rich, sweet, warm, mysterious, and strangely intimate experience of church that was, I I had never experienced like it. It was, you never knew it existed. And it was a church also that was quietly suffering. Everyone was there for a reason. Everyone brought with them some measure of pain or suffering or anxiety, theirs, or someone else's. It's the same sense that you gather at places like Guadalupe or Prague or any of the great healing shrines around the world. And even as a child, I recognize this solidarity in suffering. In Mexico, there's a custom of nine days of prayer after a death. It's a house liturgy. It's not a church ceremony. It's not led by clergy, but usually by women from the neighborhood. And there are rituals, of course, uh, around this practice, along with the prayer. There are people bring food and light candles, customs that are now, of course, being observed in Uvalde. No one is allowed to sweep the house because that would be hurrying the soul of the departed out. But on the, on the last night of the nine days of prayer, there's this beautiful, simple prayer offered that says in part, I die, but my soul does not. I love you and bless you in heaven as I did on earth. And all of this originates in these days in which we find ourselves once again, these days between ascension and Pentecost, nine days when a disoriented, abandoned group of grieving men and women gathered in prayer and finally at the end of that experienced something else, some lightening of their burden, some release or closure, acceptance, peace, something that profoundly connected their past with Jesus, with their present without him, and a future that remained unknown. It liberated them, filled them with energy and confidence and joy to face what was ahead. And just as they had to endure this in-between time of striving to accept and to understand, there's no shortcut for any of us either. One of the most important qualities that we look for in people seeking ordination is that they've acquired wisdom through suffering. That by being both broken and reassembled, they've gained insight into themselves and compassion for others. Usually candidates for ordination think that they have to present this perfect, flawless image But what we're really looking for is how the cracks have been glued together. 
the evidence that someone has endured and survived their own journey from Ascension to Pentecost. Maybe that's why the book of Revelation repeatedly talks about those who have survived, those who have come through the great trial, those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. We sense this, this connection between the experience of God's reign and those who have suffered and endured, those who have waited patiently in expectation. And you and I don't only look for that wisdom born of pain in potential clergy, it's what we look for in one another. It's how we know how to trust and who to trust and who not to. It's what we seek in those from whom we need help. It's what we offer to one another. It's the resource on which we draw in order to be good friends, good parents, good spouses. If you go into any church in Mexico, any time of day or night, you'll find people praying, lots of people, because they are a people who have suffered, continue to suffer. And in the face of poverty, abuse, violence, bloodshed, injustice, they have learnt that prayer is not just their hope, it is their sanity. The great patroness of Oaxaca is La Soledad, Our Lady of Solitude, honouring those days when a grief-stricken mother endured between the death of her son and the resurrection. The privileged and the cultivated sometimes scoff at folk customs and devotions suffer as these people have suffered before you dare to speak theology. My home parish had novena every week, every, all year long, because there was never a time when someone wasn't suffering, when someone wasn't worrying, someone wasn't struggling. And in the same way, these nine days in which we find ourselves are an icon of the church at prayer, men and women of faith inviting us to pray with them to bring our own deepest needs to the altar, to be faithful, to be truthful, to be vulnerable, to be silent, to bring all of our conflicting and competing reactions and responses into the vast spaciousness of God and to wait upon the divine initiative, the gentle advent of God's Spirit. Absent that stillness, that patience, that discipline, we thrash around, we perpetuate cycles of destruction, we rush to quick fixes and ham-fisted solutions, we self-medicate with our painkiller of choice. We react with random bursts of anger and so we go on damaging and being damaged by others. These are days in which we face our demons, in which we sit with our fears, surrender to our grief, but we do not do that alone. Next week, We'll hear Philip say to Jesus with exasperation, just show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus says, to have seen me is to have seen the Father. Believe in me. Whoever believes in me believes not only in me, but the one who sent me. At different times in the church's history, theologians and bishops and princes have tried to specify not only what the people of God must believe, but how they are to believe it. But behind all of the words and the creeds and the formulae lies a person, the silent figure on the crucifix, the searching face of the icon, the bread, the wine, alpha and omega, the beginning and end, first and last, who exhausts 
every attempt at definition, who defies our every attempt to pin him down, in whose presence all world words fail, whose eyes see us to our very core, and who is always faithful. Rowan Williams once wrote that our prayer moves between the naked trust of listening for a God whose ways we cannot speak of and a pondering of the particular history of Jesus' words and deeds and suffering. All of our prayer is nourished by these two sources, silence and the reading of the gospel. And it seems to me that this is where you and I and the whole church and where this state and this nation stand during these nine days of prayer between a God who dwells in silence and a God who has spoken eloquently and definitively in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus and finding in this sacred time a holy place realizing that just as the human story of Jesus was the very presence of God so the contours of our own stories can reveal the divine. Sanctuaries of forgiveness, shrines of compassion, mirrors of justice, seats of mercy. And so for now we simply join in that most ancient prayer of the church. Come Lord Jesus.